Welcome, everyone. It's a new episode of Building the Open Web podcast. Today, we have Jill Carlson. She's from Slow Ventures. Thanks a lot for coming today. Great to be here. So maybe we can start with your background. Where did you grow up? So I grew up on the East Coast of the United States, primarily in Boston. Grew up in the Boston suburbs. My parents both worked on Wall Street, and uh, that was kind of my first introduction through them into the wonderful world of finance, which I can't seem to get away from. And so when you were in school, you were thinking about going to finance to follow kind of like their footsteps or... Here and there, I have to confess, I did sort of the classic liberal arts thing, and I studied history, ancient history, which is, depending on who you ask, apropos of nothing or the origin of sort of all lessons in the world and in life. So I definitely wasn't taking a very pragmatic approach, admittedly. You know, I didn't study sort of accounting or business finance or, or any of these things, but I did always kind of have it in the back of my mind, just having been exposed again, through my mom and dad to the world of finance, that, that that might be a path that I would end up going down. I don't think that either they or I ever could have predicted that it would lead into a world like cryptocurrency. I think that the prediction would have been much more around it leading to a more conventional job in banking, which it initially did. But yeah, I got kind of lost or found along the way, depending on who you ask, I guess. And then after college, you joined the trading desk? That's right. Yeah. So again, I ended up, um, for a period anyway, ended up following the very kind of conventional route, did what every good ancient history liberal arts major does. And I sold out and went to Wall Street. Um, and I ended up working on an emerging market fixed income trading desk. And so what that means specifically is I was trading the primarily government bonds, the sovereign debt of uh, both countries and then also companies within countries, primarily in Latin America, but also in some other regions like emerging Europe, Africa, and, and uh, Southeast Asia. And so that was, again, sort of the conventional kind of first foray into working in finance. And was at the time Goldman Sachs interested in cryptocurrencies? It was very probably early days. Oh, yeah, not at all. So I I first started working at Goldman sort of in, in the capacity of an internship in 2011 and then went full time in, in 2012 to 2015. That was the period I was there. And so as you know, I'm sure you can appreciate that was really the very early days of, of cryptocurrency in general. And really, it was just kind of Bitcoin at the time. Um, and so there was very little interest, <laughs> certainly in institutional capacity. But even from, you know, the likes of a lot of my colleagues and, and managers and teammates, etc. there, it wasn't taken very seriously, even when Bitcoin was first starting to, to come onto the scene. And admittedly, I initially didn't take it seriously at all either. Um, it wasn't until I was really kind of introduced to it properly through a couple of people who I was working with who were on the ground. This was in, in Latin America, specifically in Argentina, um, who were actually using Bitcoin to get money out of their countries to bypass capital controls uh, and to effectively act as an inflation hedge that suddenly I was like, huh, this is actually quite interesting and, and perhaps I should take it seriously. And then you started kind of doing your own research on it. You went to Oxford. Yeah. So, I mean, I, that's kind of skipping ahead a bit, but uh, I wouldn't say that at first I was doing anything like kind of conventional research. I was sort of lurking on like Bitcoin talk forums and, and trying to understand what the hell this thing is. I, as I mentioned, I had no sort of formal background in computer science or distributed systems or, you know, any of the underpinnings of this technology. And I was for a time very intimidated by all of it, but I could kind of understand what was going on with it from the more kind of practical and kind of financial use case perspective. And so, yeah, got really interested and, and kind of self-taught my way into being able to at least grok sort of what Bitcoin was. And then, um, you know, as Ethereum emerged and came along, at least kind of trying to start to understand what was going on there. I have to, I have to say, though, it was very kind of confusing at the time. Like, what is world computer? What, what does that have to do with this like cross-border payment system and money system? You know, what does any of that have to do with being able to buy drugs online? It, it, it's so easy to look back in hindsight and say like, 
okay, you know, this is how all of these pieces fit together. But at the time, you know, as a newcomer and also as someone who is uh, trying to look forward and project what the future of, of this new system would be and, and of what these new technologies would look like, I don't think I ever could have predicted where we've ended up today. But that having been said, I could see enough to see that there was something important happening here. Um, and I ended up, yeah, as you say, pivoting kind of my whole career in that direction. Interesting. And how, how was the Bitcoin talk forum back then? What were people discussing? Was it around use cases or was it purely tech or libertarian ideas? A lot of it was just around price, <laughs> to be honest. So I first bought into Bitcoin in kind of mid-2013 and Bitcoin was a few hundred dollars at that point, but it was like just pre the big sort of run up in price that, that it experienced in 2013 to 2014, where it eclipsed $1,000 for the first time. It was all very exciting. And then, of course, it crashed after that. Um, but so as I was first starting to lurk on all of these forums, it was right again as, as Bitcoin was kind of running up. And so a lot of it was around price and, and kind of speculation, um, not totally dissimilar to sort of like what you see on Wall Street bets on, on Reddit today, that, that Reddit page that um, is, again, just a lot of kind of like memes and shit posting, et cetera. But there is this, always this kind of undertone at least in areas of not only Bitcoin talk, but other areas of the internet where people were talking about Bitcoin of like real sophistication in terms of understanding what, what it is and what it might be good for and of, of having some sense of like why this thing was valuable. It was never, or I shouldn't say it was never, but it was certainly not commonly just kind of this purely speculative thing that, that people were talking about. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide to start actually working on this? Yeah, it feels much more kind of like, you know, the Bitcoin life chose me as opposed to I chose the Bitcoin life. Um, but, you know, I would say that, that the pivot into it kind of full time happened when I got to grad school. So I, as I mentioned, I had been working in trading in New York on Wall Street um, and had become familiar with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Uh, in the interim, I'd been applying to grad school programs, and I, of course, had been applying with sort of very mainstream research topics in mind uh, in the field of finance and economics and political economics specifically. By the time I got to grad school, I took that summer off before I went to grad school and uh, really just kind of fell deep down the Bitcoin rabbit hole during that period. Um, and so by the time I got to grad school, I showed up and basically went into my supervisor and my professors. And I was like, I know I applied with this one topic, but what I really want to study now is like blockchain and Bitcoin and how this is going to be the future of financial infrastructure and how like regulation needs to catch up to it. And no one is thinking about this. And they all kind of scratched their heads and looked at me and they were like, yeah, no one is thinking about this. This this really doesn't matter, Jill. But through the course of those first couple of months there, as we were all kind of, you know, as, as students choosing our research topics and coming up with proposals, et cetera, I have to give a lot of credit to a team at the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, who during that period of that fall, this was the fall of 2015, they published a research note on digital currencies. And that covered sort of all manner of things, but it did touch on cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin and Ethereum specifically. And that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine now how groundbreaking that was in 2015. Um, you know, it was really still not a thing that was being taken seriously at that point. But that research paper, I immediately sent it to all of my professors who were giving me this pushback and got their buy-in basically based on that note to take this and run with it and, and do some research because, well, if the IMF is talking about it, there must be something, something worthwhile there. Um, and so, yeah, so I did a, a couple of years of kind of academic style research on how Bitcoin was being used at the time and how it might be used kind of going forward, uh, primarily around things like capital control evasion, tax evasion. So uh, kind of black market or, or uh, illicit or censored activities, if you will. And, you know, I would say that that research has 
to this day, you know, five years on, continued to form kind of my basis of thinking around what cryptocurrency is good for. But uh, that was my my first kind of pivot into doing this full time. And then after the graduate degree, you decided to essentially go into the nascent industry? So yeah, I, this is not an aspect of the story that I tell often, but I basically knew from that from the period of that fall when I was kind of pivoting into this and convincing these professors to to let me do the research on this topic. I knew that I probably was not going to pursue a PhD or you know go into kind of more academic research on this uh, in a serious way, but in part just given the pushback that I was getting and given kind of the lack of literature and data out there on it at the time. And so that October, November started applying for jobs at every startup in the space that I could find, which at the time numbered to be about a dozen. <laughs> and, you know, I at the time was not really networked in Silicon Valley or the Bay Area. I just started sending out effectively cold emails to anyone I knew who, you know, might have touched the space or, you know, doing kind of the the resume drop into contact at email address addresses that I could find on on these startups websites. From that that month of October or November, whenever it was that I started applying, all the way past my graduation date, I basically did not hear from anyone, which was in part, I think, because no one was really hiring at the time, like the industry was not expanding dramatically during that period in 2015. You know, there wasn't a lot of new funding pouring into the space. But you know, it was also certainly because I had such an unconventional background to be trying to to get into the space. Again, I did not have a network out here. I did not have like product manager experience. I certainly had a, you know, very little only really self-taught technical knowledge, you know, remains limited probably to this day. Um, And so that was a a very sort of like frustrating and fear inducing experience. Cause I was like, oh God, I'm going to have to go back to Wall Street and work in this, you know, kind of mainstream finance thing, which just feels so archaic and it's definitely the past. And this Bitcoin thing is the future. And all I want to do is, is go work in that space. But eventually I did land an, an awesome position at a company called Chain, um, which eventually got acquired by Stellar out here in the Bay Area. And so that was kind of my lucky break. Well, and what was your main kind of focus area while you joined Chain? So yeah, I I joined Chain shortly after they had pivoted into kind of enterprise blockchain. Um, And so they were working on, we were working on projects with the likes of NASDAQ and Citibank and State Street, um, you know, big financial institutions, all of whom candidly, we're trying to figure out what the hell this blockchain thing was and and how it might play into their infrastructure. And we did some very, very cool projects with them around basically tokenizing assets. Um, So, you know, for example, the, the project that we did with NASDAQ was an exploration of what a tokenized secondary market or exchange would look like for all manner of alternative assets with State Street, we did a project around what effectively sort of tokenized depository receipts within their own back office would look like and and some of the optimizations that might grow out of that. I think in many ways, this work was sort of ahead of its time. And, you know, we were were also exploring doing all of this with uh, sort of a hybrid kind of permissioned chain technology, which... I think it was very innovative, again, at the time, this was a few years ago now in its own right, but I think ultimately has proven to be eclipsed. And I think that, you know, the the acquisition or the merger with with Stellar kind of speaks to this by sort of permissionless and, and public chain technology. Um, but it was a very cool period. And, and uh, yeah, I still look back on on that period, even though, you know, to greater or lesser degrees, things have come of of those projects that we had with those banks and big institutions. You know, I look back on that period with kind of it's a very starry eyed period of like, wow, anything is possible. Like, look at we're, what we're piloting with NASDAQ and and these other big, big financial institutions taking notice of this. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting. And then you, after this, decided to work kind of like for yourself and represent many different projects on different assignments. So again, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure that I, uh, I went into that with with kind of any sort of strategy. It's more kind of like I stumbled into it. You know, at the time that I left Chain, two of my very close friends in the space, uh, Kathleen and Arthur Brightman, they had just conducted the Tezos token sale. They had just sort of officially publicly launched the project. Um, and they kind of turned to me and they were like, hey, we we could use help. And so I first came on board with them. Now, of course, you know, the Tezos Foundation is domiciled in Switzerland. I was very clear with them, like, I'm very comfortable with my life here in, in San Francisco. I'm not sure I'm ready to pick up tomorrow and, and take this gamble and move to move to Zug. And so they said, okay, well, you know, come on board as, as kind of a contractor, which was something I had never candidly thought of before. Um, but I came on board with them as as a contractor and started doing just sort of all, again all manner of like operations and and business development work and strategy work and and uh, partnership building as well as you know working on some of the internal governance stuff that was going on at the time and yeah started learning a lot from that and then as I was as I was doing that other projects kind of got wind of what I was doing with them and were kind of like hey you know we we could use you in kind of a similar capacity or, or as an advisor or whatever. And it just kind of developed from there. But there were definitely periods of that where I was very sort of uncertain of what I was doing. It felt like there wasn't much rhyme or reason or, or strategy uh, behind it. But again, in hindsight, you can always make things make sense. Um, and it ended up working out, you know, during that period, people would often ask me like, okay, but what do you really want to do? You know, you're advising or contracting for all of these different projects, but like, presumably, Jill, you're just kind of biding your time until you go and start something or, you know, until you end up joining a company, et cetera. And, you know, there was some truth in that in the back of my mind the whole time I was kind of thinking, oh, maybe I'll end up joining one of these projects full time, et cetera. But the reality was I, I also just really enjoyed what I was doing. More often than not, my answer to that question was, well, I'm I'm doing what I want to be doing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, I think that there is something very unique about the crypto space where often I think that there are a lot of sort of synergies to be found between projects. And, and just by virtue of the fact that the crypto industry is so nascent, you know, it's it's still growing. The whole pie is growing. I think that very often it's less that projects at least should conceive themselves as competitive with one another. And much more often, I think that, you know, there is value to having someone who's actually working across a number of different areas of the space. And again, you know, hopefully unlocking all kinds of synergies and, and complements between those projects. Yep. No, that makes very much resonates with how I think about the space too. Yeah, no, I can tell from a lot of a lot of the way that that Nier has approached the space and the different collaborations that you all have done. I'm not at all surprised to hear that that resonates. And then you founded Open Money Initiative. How how did you uh, start on that? Sounds like you essentially got interested, got exposure to things happening in South America even earlier. Yeah, absolutely. In a way, my work with the Open Money Initiative harkens back to my very first experience of cryptocurrency, which again goes back to these friends and colleagues down in Argentina actually using this to get money out of the country and, and evade the regulations and policies of their country. But it also more directly, I think, grew out of this period of working across all of these different amazing projects and amazing companies within crypto during the couple of years when I was I was kind of freelancing and, and acting as an independent advisor and consultant. And again, you know, I have the utmost respect, obviously, for all of these companies that that I've worked with or invested in. Um, and I have very, very high hopes for where all of them are going. But that question of where is it going was the pervasive question throughout all of my work in the space, whether that was uh, my academic work, you know, back when I was in graduate school, whether that was my work with these big institutions at Chain, whether that was my work with layer one protocols like Tezos or Zcash, um, 
or CODA, whether that was my work with uh, DeFi projects, which were obviously quite nascent at the time, like Zero X, um, you know, there was this pervasive question of, well, okay, where is it going? What is the use case? What is the killer app? What is the point? And after a while, you know, after sort of a sufficient number of days of waking up and looking myself in the mirror and having to answer, I don't know, I don't actually have conviction yet on where it goes. I, I decided I needed to do something about that. And at the time, I had the great good fortune of starting to get to know a couple of friends in the space, um, Alejandro Machado, uh, who is himself Venezuelan, which of course everyone always points to Venezuela as one of the key places where Bitcoin has taken off and, and should take off, um, and who's done amazing work in the space besides. And also Jamal Montessor, who is uh, a designer, um, spent a number of years at IDEO designing for big companies like Google, et cetera, and has a ton of experience answering exactly this question of like, okay, a given product or a given technology, what is it good for? How do we think about the why behind it? And so the three of us teamed up and you know we were all very passionate about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency in general, uh, but all of us were having this kind of period of reckoning at the same time. And we said, well, you know, hell, let's, let's do something about it. And so we, we teamed up with a, a number of projects that I had already been working with or that, you know, each of us had sort of connections into in various ways, including some of those layer one projects that I mentioned, like Zcash or Tezos um, or Cosmos, including also, though, importantly, you know, other groups like the Human Rights Foundation, who's done incredible work in, in Bitcoin specifically in terms of exploring the intersection of Bitcoin and human rights and, and individual freedoms. And so we teamed up with, with all of these groups and said, hey, you're all asking the same question of where is this going? And we said, let us, you know, fund us, let us take that question and bring it to the field and figure out where there might be a use case here and come back to you, hopefully, of course, with kind of product insights um, and insights that you can take and, and put into implementation, put to work, you know, in order to better serve people. Ultimately, that was that was the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate goal. And so with all of that, we we executed our first project last year. Uh, I can talk a bit more about that and kind of what we found out there. Uh, we have a couple more projects in the works now um, that will hopefully be taking off over the course of the next few months. And I'm very excited and pleased with the work that we've done so far. But, you know, it feels like we're really only just kind of scraping the surface yet. Mm -hmm. And how were some of the findings from this initial study? So, yeah, so the initial study that we did was focused on Venezuela in, in large part because that, of course, is the place that everyone, including myself, always points to as, you know, Venezuela is, is where people are using Bitcoin or should be using Bitcoin in cryptocurrency. Um, and, you know, if I, had, if I had a Satoshi for every time I or someone I know has gotten up on stage or on a panel and said, you know, well, I, you know, as, as a Westerner, as someone living in the United States, I don't need Bitcoin, but people in Venezuela do, then we would all be very rich indeed. But that's what we decided was to say, okay, let's go after kind of the most extreme case. It also, of course, helped that, that my co-founder Alejandro is himself Venezuelan um, and figure out what's going on on the ground there. So we spent a, a period of time, uh, about six weeks, living in Colombia primarily um, and traveling to the border of Venezuela, uh, working with refugees and, and migrants who traveled to other cities in Colombia like Medellin and Bogota and interviewing them, conducting design research studies, uh, et cetera. And some of the big takeaways, you know, were were surprising to me in the sense that, you know, you expect these people who have been living with a completely broken money system for, in some cases, pretty much their entire lives, um, dealing with hyper, hyper inflation on the, on the order of magnitude of 10 million percent inflation a year, which is hard to even fathom what that looks like, um, who have been dealing with stringent capital controls, who have been dealing with having to 
think and keep accounts in various currencies just to, even to reason about what value is you would expect them to say well you know trust is completely broken down um you know i'm i'm looking for what we in crypto would call kind of the most trustless system uh, imaginable um and you know i want to not have to rely on a bank or another individual or another human to deal with my money for me. I want it to just be in my control. But on the contrary, so much of what we found was that these systems actually still continue to work, but solely based on trusted networks that people have built out for themselves. And so, you know, to give you one example of this, what I would point to is frequently what we would see is people would have access, people in Venezuela or migrants from Venezuela would have access to a US dollar bank account. Now, how is that possible? One might ask. It's possible not because all of these people have at some point lived in the United States and been able to open a Wells Fargo account. No, it's possible because a majority of, of the, the people we spoke to anyway, you know, it's not a statistical majority, certainly of the population, but many of the people we spoke to they they knew someone who had lived in the United States and had a Wells Fargo account or a Bank of America account or um, whatever it is. And so they would say, oh, well, no, I mean, I have $200, but it's held or custodied effectively by my nephew's girlfriend's uncle's cat sitter who went to school in Miami. And, you know, we would say, well, like, OK, but how is that your two hundred dollars then? And, you know, they would say, well, it, it's, you know, it's this it's this in this person's bank account. But they know they sort of have it written on a line item somewhere that that two hundred dollars is mine. And when I need to cash it out, you know, they know to just sort of give me the exchange rate and I can walk over to their house and, and pick up the money. But in the local currency in Bolivars, but they at least have this this sort of access to a currency that is not hyperinflating. And again, you know, there I just feel like that story is salient, both because it was so pervasive in terms of just this theme of people relying on sort of very trusted networks, but also because it runs so contrary to so much of what we hear about and think about and talk about in this space, where so frequently the conversation is, how do we make this system perfectly trustless where you don't have to rely on anyone or anything? And in fact, that's not really the aspect of it that's broken um, because people are, again, still very happy to rely on each other. It's just a very different threat model or attack vector than, you know, certainly I was ever used to thinking about. Yeah, it reminds me how how I sent money to my mom, actually. Uh, I'm from like Eastern Europe, from Belarus, and uh, I rely on like networks of friends. So like I give sort of Venmo here in US cash to somebody and that person asks his father back in Belarus to give cash to my mom. So it's like a little bit like roundabout way to, you know, send money. I, I feel silly then even even telling you this story because it, it sounds like it's it's a very familiar kind of practice to you. And yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all, you know, knowing knowing where you're from and and um, you know, some of the dynamics of, of sort of money systems there. And I think that, you know, one takeaway from that is and this was a takeaway from from this initial set of research we did too, is we don't often talk about our money systems as being very siloed, but in fact they are, right? And you know, you can take that to any level of granularity you want, where you can look at it on the very, very macro scale and say, we are each siloed within the financial systems of our own countries. And sometimes those silos can talk to each other, you know, directly. If if I need to send money to my friend in the United Kingdom. I can do that, you know, via bank wire or bank transfer. It's going to still probably take several days and I'll have to pay some money on top of it as, as a fee and it'll be a pain. But those two silos can talk to each other, but other silos really can't. And then you kind of have to dig a tunnel or hack your way through. But then you can also look at it on a much more micro level of silos and look at you know, even I go to the salad restaurant down the street and they don't take Apple Pay or they don't take um, American Express. And, you know, that is is also, you know, a very kind of 
first world privileged version of, of dealing with financial silos, of course. Um, but that nonetheless is kind of a parallel. And it's so much to me of what the value of cryptocurrency is, is about digging tunnels between silos. And again, whether that's you know across countries or across different means of payments, even within a country, I think that that's where a lot of the power of cryptocurrency lies. Yeah. And how did you also then decide to join the venture capital firm? Are you focusing on a crypto side there? Yeah. So I started to get to know the team at Slow several years back um, when I first started kind of freelancing and I was also doing bits and pieces of investing on my own at the time. And so, again, started to get to know the team at Slow, who at the time was making their first real forays as a fund into investing in crypto. And so I had a lot of fun conversations with them, a lot of great sort of banter back and forth about what the future of the space would look like, a lot of great debate, and came to have a lot of respect for the perspective that the team at Slow brings to it. And, you know, I would say I also came to have a lot of respect for the way that Slow has approached the space, especially being a generalist venture capital fund where, you know, we invest in everything from B2B software to retail direct to consumer companies uh, over into, of course, cryptocurrency now. So many generalist funds in that period of sort of late 2016, 2017, 2018 dabbled in crypto because it was kind of the cool thing. And then many of them, not all, of course, but many of them then took you know a hard step back in 2018 when crypto stopped being cool and, and the bubble was starting to burst. And Slow was among the generalist funds that actually during that period really kind of doubled down and said, no, no, you know, uh, nothing fundamental has changed about our beliefs. Sure, you know, the prices are changing, they're coming and going, but sort of true to the name Slow Ventures, you know, took a very long term kind of time horizon outlook to it and said, you know, things things are often slow to develop and they experience hype cycles along the way. And in fact, you know, we do want to have crypto to continue to be a strong part of our portfolio. And so that, you know, that was very impressive to me. And that was a large part of the conversation that then surrounded me ending ending up joining full time last year. And so, you know, that is, of course, in addition to some of the other work that I'm still doing with the Open Money Initiative, et cetera. But certainly my day job at this point is with Slow. And yeah, I spend, you know, probably roughly half of my time on cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency kind of related investments. But then I also have the privilege now of getting to spend another half of my time on all manner of other companies, investments, and projects, which I think has been very valuable to me and is also hopefully very valuable to the cryptocurrency investments that we've made. Because one observation that I had is that I think very often crypto companies operate in their own sort of bubble away from sort of standard startup logic. And in a way, I think that that's good because I don't think that standard startup logic can apply wholesale to cryptocurrency. Um, it's just a totally different beast. It's a totally different model. There are so many idiosyncrasies to the things that you want to look for in a good crypto project or that would make a good crypto investment that you know, I don't think that you want to just, again, take standard startup logic and, and try to apply it. But at the same time, there are certain aspects of standard startup logic that our standard logic for a reason. And you know, those lessons have been painfully learned by startups and by venture capitalists over the course of decades. And so, you know, why why have that all get lost? Why not at least take the lessons that that can apply and apply them over? So that's been a really cool part of the experience for me. Yep. It kind of reminds me also like of how near is right now we started on Silicon Valley initially, then we kind of like expanded. We have 50 people here, 50 people all over the world. And now we have a lot of people from Web3, actually more native people who have been in space joining for the first time. And we almost have like now like merge of two cultures, like kind of Silicon Valley culture and like Web3 native culture. Yeah, that's got to present its own its own interesting challenges. But I, I think that there's also the argument to be made that that will really strengthen the project over time to to be able to draw from kind of the best of both of those cultures and those worlds. 
And so how do you think also about founders approaching you and like, how do you think about the compositions of their teams, markets they're going after? Like, how do you evaluate them? Also, like what kinds of patterns maybe you're seeing, like good or bad? I'll be curious. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll maybe stick to to kind of crypto projects for the purpose of this conversation initially. But if you want me to expand, I'm I'm happy to. It's been really interesting over the last year as a lot of the focus and the hype in the space has shifted into DeFi. And I think that it it has shifted there very rightly. It's a space that I have long been very bullish on. But, you know, if I look back to kind of where the space was when I first got excited about it back in, say, 2017, I think that it was so early then, both in terms of the sort of components and protocols and primitives that had been built out in order to craft the products, but also in terms of how ready users and consumers were to then adopt those products. Um, I think that there were still a lot of challenges there then. And I think that, you know, increasingly as you know, a lot of experiments have been run and and now a lot of products like Compound, like Uniswap are, are two that I would point to have really done a nice job of, of drawing people in and drawing in capital. Um, and so DeFi remains a space that, that I'm very excited about. But I think that one of the challenges with DeFi that speaks to a challenge of the space as a whole is that it is still in many ways very sort of self-serving for people who are already in crypto and who are kind of crypto native. And so what I would say is for me, the projects that I'm most excited about are those that feel like they have the promise of bringing new entrants into crypto, of really growing the pie as a whole, of bringing in new users. Um, and and those are the areas, again, where I'm I'm most excited. And I think that some of those exist within DeFi. I think that you know, some of those are are even just sort of in the much more conventional, uh, sort of not protocol oriented, but like exchange spaces or, or other elements of, of infrastructure, um, building those out, innovating on kind of the user experience of, of all of these types of things. And so, you know, one example there that, that we've invested in would be River Financial, which is a kind of solely Bitcoin focused exchange. Where again, I think that they're doing a really nice job of of drawing in new users, and you know, who knows? Like maybe those users just end up investing in Bitcoin on River Financial. I think more likely that ends up being kind of the gateway experience for those users, and then you know we'll see them kind of trickle through over time. And so that's that's where I'm most excited about placing bets. There's one other space that that I would mention as well, just because I think it's maybe relevant to you and near and, and to, to some of your audience, but that's a sort of the layer one of protocols still as well. I think that there's something of a sense in the, in the cryptocurrency world right now, and certainly amongst investors that, okay, layer one has kind of played its course. You know, we've got like 50 layer ones out there all competing for the same user base, both in terms of buyers and token holders and also in terms of developers like one of those is going to be the winner let's let it play out you know we we don't need any more i'm still actually quite bullish though on new layer one protocols that are entering i think that it's still such early days i think that there's a lot to be said for the ways in which these you know what we tend to classify today as layer one protocols will end up interacting with each other over time um, will end up serving rather different user bases you know I, I think it's kind of a fallacy to think that they're all going after the same user base or like they're all just going after the same subset of ethereum devs it's like you look at the group of developers that exist in the world such a tiny, tiny fraction of those are Ethereum developers. I think that, again, that's kind of the fallacy there. So I remain really excited to see what layer one projects will do, both that have launched already, but are maybe in their earlier days and that are still coming to market. Yeah, I'm definitely on the same page there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might be. Glad to hear it. And uh, what are you also the most excited overall in founders? Have you seen any change in, in last year in terms of like the level of founders entering the space or or, or maybe, maybe it's not quite there and, and you want some changes happening. Maybe we need better educational resources for like repeat entrepreneurs to join the industry. You know, I mean, I have to say there's this, and I've, I've probably said this in the past, someone's going to dig up a tweet of mine if I, if I go too far here. I've probably said in the past, never and always says, you know, 
oh, you know, the quality of founder within crypto was, you know, quite poor a few years ago and you can see it on the rise now and that's a really bullish indicator, you know, whatever. That's kind of the implication of the conversation. I actually think that the founders in the crypto space have for a very long time been of a very high caliber and quality. And I think that that speaks to a few things. I think it speaks in part to the passion that most founders bring into this space where the vision of what crypto can offer is just so enormous. You know, it's it's quite different from the type of vision that that you need to have to go and start, you know, a, another sort of project or, or company. I think it also speaks to how multidisciplinary the space is, where it just takes sort of a certain amount of intellectual horsepower that I aspire to have and I try to keep up with to be able to understand and, and work in areas that range from like financial engineering to distributed systems to you know, information security to best sort of developer tools, you know, all of these areas, it's so multidisciplinary. I think that it's always been a very high caliber of founder. The one thing that I will call out though, in answer to this question is I think that Coinbase has done an incredible job of generating kind of the next generation of entrepreneur in this space. Just the quality of talent that has always come out of Coinbase, you know, going back to some of its its earliest founders and, and PMs, even to talent that joined Coinbase in like 27, 2018, and are now sort of two or three years later coming out of it. I just continue to be so, so impressed with everyone who I meet from Coinbase. And so that's the one shout out that I would give in answer to that question. Yeah. And maybe you can also mention a little bit about the kinds of topics you like to cover in a different media side of your also day-to-day uh, -day activities, because sometimes you're writing for Coindesk, you also had a blog. So like, how, how do you approach that, uh, the media aspect, and what do you like publishing about? So yeah, the media aspect is, is funny, because people often ask me, you know, oh, how did you start writing? Or, you know, why did you start? I, I used to run a podcast with my good friend Meltem in the space, you know, what prompted you to do that? And honestly, so much of it grew out of me just kind of needing an outlet often to rant about things that, that I was observing going on in cryptocurrency or, you know, call things out that I thought were very wrong as, as kind of a narrative violation or whatever it was, because there's so much noise in crypto and, you know, there are so many people kind of pushing agendas or shilling their tokens or whatever it is that I most often kind of find myself driven by a reaction to those types of, of narratives. And so again, you know, very frequently it's me seeing something and being like, that's just wrong or like, this is going to generate confusion. And then me just sitting down at a blank medium article or sitting down at, at a microphone with Meltem and just trying to call it out and be like, no, this is not right. Like, you know, I wish they weren't saying this because this is going to create confusion, whatever it is. So it's it's been much more kind of driven by by things like that. But it's it's become an incredible way to connect with and, and meet people in the space and, and of course, you know, share ideas and, and perspectives. And it's, it's funny for me now to look back at some of my earlier writing from sort of even 2015, 2016, 2017, like, wow, so much of this was wrong. And so much of this has also played out, you know, exactly as I might've hoped. And so in that way, it's also become kind of a fun record to have, again, of almost like wins and losses of where I've been right and wrong. Got it. And in terms of educational materials, have you seen anything good online for the founders, like somebody like entering the space, considering the space, maybe alongside with other potential areas like consumer web, enterprise software, machine learning? Is there anything that you've seen for the founders that is a good source of inspiration? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I would say for crypto founders, I think that I was, uh, I'll give a plug for Andreessen Horowitz's, um, their crypto startup school. I think that they did a really incredible job of developing a curriculum that I believe much of it is is open online now for founders and prospective founders to be able to access that covers everything from 
again, kind of the conventional startup side of like how to think about, you know, user research and product design, these types of things, all the way over into obviously kind of much more specific and targeted to, to crypto founders, uh, that sort of guidance. So, you know, I think, again, Jesse Walden, who ran that program, did a really phenomenal job with that. But what I would say is that I think that there's no great replacement, you know, no matter how many Paul Graham blog posts you read or, or you know, sort of zero to one style books you read, there's no good replacement for just starting to meet people and starting to network. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I was privileged in many, many ways, but I really did not have much of a network in Silicon Valley when I was first entering the space. And it was just a lot of cold emails that that eventually um, people picked up and, and were willing to talk to me. And I would encourage, you know, anyone who feels like they're somewhat on the outside of the space right now to do the same, you know, reach out to, whether it's me or other people you you respect or follow, you know, on Twitter, reach out to them via whatever email address you can find for them online and just start having those conversations and, and trying to learn more kind of real time and not in person, obviously, these days, but through conversation experience as opposed to just reading and, and more passively consuming. Because, yeah, there is just really no better replacement for that kind of learning. Yep. And where can people find more about you online? Yeah, Twitter is probably the best place. I probably spend way too much time on, on Twitter. It's just at Jill Ruth Carlson on Twitter. And I struggle, admittedly, with keeping up with DMs. DMs can become kind of a cesspool when you're a public persona within crypto, people trying to shill you tokens and whatever else. So, you know, pop up in my mentions or whatever on on Twitter or you know especially if you're starting project or starting to explore that by all means email me at jill at slow.co s-l-o-w dot c-o cool well thank you for coming today oh my pleasure thank you so much for having me this is really fun thank you for listening you can find more episodes of this podcast at openwebcollective.com. If you're a founder looking for help with product, go to market or fundraise, apply on the same exact website. It's openwebcollective.com. If you really like this episode, I would really appreciate if you give us a review on a platform of choice where you listen to podcasts to. And finally, if you're on Twitter, we are at openwebfounders. Again, the handle is at openwebfounders. I'll see you next week.